We're on a quest for fresh fire. And it's not something that's temporary. It's not a series we happen to be into. Uh, but it's something I pray, I trust it will become an ongoing passion. Amen. That it will be uh, non-consuming or all-consuming, I should say. No pun intended. How many want an all-consuming fire? And so we're pressing in, we're seeking God. And this morning, uh, the Lord dropped in my heart uh, a word to share with you concerning Moses. Moses. And we're going to look at Moses' quest and his experience with fire. And in that quest, in that, uh, that teaching, I really believe the Lord's going to stir our hearts. And he's going to stir our hearts to, and give us uh, a real understanding of how we can press in more and all that God has for us. Amen. So without further ado... Let's look at Romans chapter 8, verse 18. Let's jump right in today. And here's a scripture we're all familiar with. It, For I consider that the suff sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory which shall be revealed in us. For the earnest expectation of creation eagerly waits for the revealing of the sons of God. For the creation was subject to futility, not willingly, but because of him who subjected it in hope. Because the creation itself also will be delivered from the bondage of corruption into the glorious liberty of the children of God. Now, for we know that the whole creation groans and labors with birth pangs together unto now. Wow, that's, that's pretty heavy, isn't it? And uh, this is such an uh, enlightening, uh, powerful scripture. And uh, I think if you'd agree with me, as we look at the world around us, it seems like it's, it's just uh, unhinged. Everything has just seemed to come off the hinges and, and spinning out of control. Uh, we live in perilous times, as uh, 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 Paul said to young Timothy. And it seems like it's getting darker and darker and darker. And as the scripture says, gross darkness covers the earth. But I think this scripture speaks to us in so many ways. Have you ever just scratched your head and cried out, what is going on in the world? Well, I think this scripture answers what's going on in the world. The whole earth is groaning. Wow. All of creation. Everything we see about us, especially mankind, they're groaning, they're crying out, they're yearning for what? The full redemption, the full redemption of mankind, the full restitution of everything God promised. Ever since the fall of man, the, the earth has been whirling in all kinds of corruption and all kinds of convulsions it's because of sin but God is faithful and he has promised amen that he is going to redeem the earth once again and everything that we're seeing is the earth all of creation responding and crying out to God God when God answer our cry God redeem us redeem the earth Mankind all around us, no matter what their situation or circumstance, they're moaning and groaning from deep within. Oh, what's the answer? What's, wh where's our deliverance? Wh what's the point? Right? I think that's fair to say. And so uh, Paul is using the example of a, a, a woman that's groaning and travailing in giving birth. Amen? And after the groaning, after the pain, I remember it was, it was hard. <laughs> right. <laughs> after the groaning and, the, you're, and off the travail, how I many know there is joy? There is joy that comes forth when you see, you know, uh, the product of, of your travail and, and, and why you were crying out. And so uh, I think in, uh, in our modern day, when you consider... Uh, the, the, uh, the condition of the world, the fall of man, the condition of people in general, amen? God wants to answer the groan. God is answering the cry and the groan of the earth and people all around us. And I propose to you, and it's very scriptural, that he answers that groan with fire. God answers the groaning deep within mankind for purpose and meaning in life with the fire. Now, we're going to look at three events 
uh, and times in history when God hears and answers the groan and travail of his creation uh, with fire. And so this morning, we're just going to touch on uh, Isaiah, touch on Pentecost, but what we really want to look at is Moses, okay? God, God raised up Moses for a season and a time to answer the groans and the moans and the travail of a people, and he answered with fire. But if you recall Isaiah, you know, Isaiah's complaining and whining about the people and how they're hard to deal with, and, and God never contended with that. He said, yeah, you're right. They're, 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 they're a bunch of knuckleheads, but I kind of see it different. And he said, I tell you what, look up. And he placed fire on his lips, right? He placed holy fire on his lips, and he went forth, and he became a mouthpiece, and he became God's agent for the groan and the travail and the crying out of mankind. And then we look at uh, Pentecost, we look at Pentecost when God looked down at his creation and said, oh my God, it's time. It's time. The moaning and the groaning and the travail and the cry of my people, my creation has become so great. He said, I have to answer. It's time. It's fully time. It's come. And he sent 120 to an upper room and the fire of God fell. Amen. And he answered the moan and the cry and the groaning and the travail of his creation with holy fire. Hallelujah. So, how about Moses? <laughs> Let me ask you this. Do you know anyone? Do you personally know anyone that is moaning? <laughs> so, that's terrible. Yeah, my husband. No, I no. Do you know anyone that is moaning, groaning, travailing in the midst of their sin, in the midst of their bondage, in the midst of all the hardship, maybe in the midst of their affliction, their sickness, poverty, disease, all the things in life that can press upon you and press you down and bring you into captivity. Do you know anyone around you that's got a moan and a groan? They don't understand what it really is. They don't understand necessarily how to express it. And they don't even know the answer. But God says, I still answer with fire. Don't you know people like that all around you? Sure. Now, let's look at Moses. Look at, and look at his life-changing encounter with fire. Look at um, Exodus 2, verse 23. Now, it happened in the process of time. Now, now, now it happened in the process of time that the king of Egypt died. Then the children of Israel groaned. Hmm. They groaned because of the bondage, and they cried out, and their cry came up to God because of their bondage. So God heard their groaning, and God remembered his covenant with Abraham, Isaac, and with Jacob. And God looked upon the children of Israel, and God acknowledged them. And I like what other translation says. It literally says he had compassion on them. Right? So God is looking down at his people all these years in bondage, all these years uh, under the cruel taskmaster, uh, uh, Pharaoh and the whips and all that, and he looks down upon them, and he, and he hears their groaning, amen, and he has compassion. Aren't you glad God has compassion? <laughs> compassion is greater than pity. The Bible also tells us that he has pity, but thank God. You see, you can have pity. You can look at someone in some type of situation and have genuine pity for them, right? You feel for them. You may cry for them. You may pray for them. But, but compassion is greater than pity because compassion is pity with its arms rolled up, its sleeves rolled up, right? Compassion is pity in action. It's saying, I pity you. I feel for you. My heart breaks for you. But I'm not going to just sit back and pity you. I'm going to arise and take action and help you get delivered and healed and touched in the midst of your situation. Thank God he is compassionate. Doesn't the scripture say he renews his compassion every morning? Wow. I don't know about you, but I, I embrace that every morning. Lord God, thank you for your compassion. Now, I believe that, uh, that God acts and he delivers his people from all their bondage. He sets up divine appointments with the fire of God. Now, let's look at this scripture. This is the infamous Wonderful, exciting scripture where a Moses, Moses has an encounter with the burning bush. Look at this. 
Now Moses, now Moses, now, now (laughs) Moses was tending the flock of Jethro, his father-in-law, the priest of Midian. And he led the flock to the back of the desert and came to Mount Horrible, I mean Horeb, the mountain of God. And the angel of the Lord appeared to him in a flame of fire from the midst of a bush. So he looked and behold, the bush was burning with fire, but the bush was not consumed. Then Moses said, I will now turn aside and see this great sight, why the bush does not burn. So when the Lord saw that he turned aside to look, God called to him from the midst of the bush and said, Moses, (laughs) Moses, here I am. Then he said, do not draw near this place. Take your sandals off your feet, for the place where you stand is holy like the presence of God was this morning as we began to recognize, sing about, and experience his holiness. Moreover, he said, I am the God of your father, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And Moses hid his face, for he was afraid to look upon God. And the Lord said, I've surely seen the oppression of my people who are in Egypt and have heard their cry because of their taskmasters, for I know their sorrows. So I've come down to deliver them out of the hand of the Egyptians to bring them up from that land to a good and large land, to a land flowing with milk and honey, to the place of the Canaanites and the Hittites and the Amorites, the Perizzites, the Hivites, the Jebusites, the Termites. Now therefore, behold, the cry of the children of Israel has come to me, and I have heard seen their oppression with which the Egyptians oppressed them. Come now, therefore, and I will send you to Pharaoh that you may bring my people, the children of Israel, out of Egypt. Wow. Now, we know at this time that Moses was 80 years old. And it's very interesting because he lives 120 years. And if you look at the life of uh, Moses, you see you can divide it into uh, three, uh, three 40-year increments. His first 40 years was when he was raised in Pharaoh's house and he learned all the ways of Egypt and the world. He was polished to become a great leader. And then the next 40 years to the time he's 80 years old, it's that time of testing. And he's in the wilderness. And he's, he's in that time of preparation. And then the following 40 years from the time he was 80 to the time he was 120 was the time he was actually leading the children of Israel in the wilderness. And then he, of course, he exchanged the baton and passed it on to Joshua, and they went into the promised land. Very interesting and very significant that the number 40, like all numbers, is very, very, very important in the scripture. 40 speaks of testing, trials, preparation, process. It speaks of, you know, a wilderness. Very, very important number, 40. Jesus was 40 days in the wilderness, right? Being tested and tried. The children of Israel were 40 years in the wilderness. It's interesting. We're all going to go through the wilderness season, a time of testing and preparation. Jesus did it in 40 days. Children of Israel took them 40 years. The rest of us, somewhere between that, right? I'd rather be closer to the 40 days, but 40 is really a prophetic number. It's a, it's a number that speaks to you directly in what God is doing in your life. But 40 is significant, significant. Uh, Jonah preached to uh, Nineveh for 40, for 40 days, right? There was 40 days between the, uh, the resurrection and Jesus' ascension. You look at the book of Judges, and there's 40-year cycles. When they fell into oppression and bondage and captivity, they cried out and they were delivered. 40, 40, 40. It was 40 days that Goliath stood before Israel and taunted them and said, send me a a warrior. 40 days of that testing. How long did it rain on the earth during the flood? 40 days, 40, 40, 40. We see it so significantly, but here's the good news. There's always an end to that season. There's always an end to that 40-day season of testing, and at the end of that season, there's promotion, there's breakthrough, there's conquest, there's victory. God does something fresh and new. Hallelujah. After 40 days, Jesus came forth in the power of the Holy Spirit. 
After 40 years, the children of Israel went in and conquered the promised land. Hallelujah. After 40 days, Nineveh repented. After 40 days, David shows up and says, who's this big mouth giant, amen, and takes him out. 40, 40, 40. Thank God. There's something significant about 40. Are you with me? So what about Moses? He was in the wilderness 40 years. Have you ever felt like Moses? You can say yes or no or not. <laughs> I have. have. Have you ever been through a season where it's just like, okay, Lord, when's this going to end? When's the dryness? When's the barrenness? When's the testing? When's all this over, Lord? And let, let's get on with the show. And I can relate to this, and I think you can too. Uh, in some ways, I feel like I've been in that place. I've been in that wilderness situation. But for Moses, things are about to radically change. But I love how the whole narrative begins when it says, now Moses was tending the flock. Well, I'll put my name there. Now Lou was tending the flock. Just being faithful as I can be, but I am really encouraged about something because I believe there's an appointed time and I believe I'm about to have a fresh encounter with God. And I believe every one of you that are here, that are part of this congregation, that sit under this message, that are part of this covenant people, now, get ready, God has seen the wilderness, he's seen the barren place, he has seen your faithfulness pressing through, and I happen to believe he has set a divine appointment. Now, just don't hear a message. If you're just going to hear a message, that's all you'll get. Right? If you hear a nice message, well, that was a nice sermon. Well, what that, what's that going to do for you? <laughs> that was a nice sermon. I pray we hear a word. I, I never want to stand here and give you a sermon. I want to bring a word from God, and before God, I labor before him that I might be able to do that. And if I don't have it, I don't want to say anything. I really believe this is a good word for us. So what qualifies you and I to experience this life-changing situation, this experience where we have a life-changing encounter with the fire of God, the presence of the living God? God speaks to us. We arise in his fire and go forth and bring deliverance to a groaning, come on, yearning, crying generation. What does that? What does it take? It begins with a now. It all begins with a now. Just a now. Now. Now Moses was faithful doing what he called, was called to do. If we're going to experience a divine encounter, that's the word. I believe God has a divine encounter for every one of us, a radical experience with him that will change our life forever. As a matter of fact, we've got to have it. We need it. But we've got to be faithful, and we've got to be now. Now. Now, Moses. In other words, now. Moses was just doing what he did every day for 40 years. He was faithful for what God put in his hand to do. He was faithful in the little thing, even when it was boring, even when it made no sense, even when he was about to scream and say, God, I can't take this any longer. He remained faithful to that which God put in his hand. Amen? You're faithful as a dad. You're faithful as a son. You're faithful as a mama, a spouse. You're faithful on your job. You're faithful servant in the house of God. Lord, I don't understand all this. I'm dry. I feel like at times I'm in the wilderness, but I'm still now. I'm here now. There's something to be said for being faithful. And we will never have our divine encounter, a life-changing encounter that will radically change our life if we're not faithful for a season in the now. So important. And I'll look at it this way. I'll, I'll play on the word a little bit. Now. What does now mean? <laughs> now. <laughs> right. Now. In the Hebrew, the word means now. No. Now. 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 Today. Now. In this season we're in right now. Grab that thing and say, now. Now. God appeared to Moses in a burning bush. Now God is about to appear to a people that have been faithful, even in the barren dry place. Get ready. Now, amazing thought. An entire people group, a whole nation's groaning, groaning out, desperate for deliverance, right? And God uses this one man and the fire of his presence radically changes this man and empowers this man to be God's answer. That is so powerful. 
Mm -mm -mm -mm. But you know what? It's like God, God takes a person out of the natural situation. He takes them out of the mundane, regular experiences of life, takes them beyond their natural understanding or reasoning, and appears. Wait a minute. A burning bush? That's pretty heavy. A burning bush that talks? Well, that's getting even more heavy, right? A burning bush that's not consumed? I believe God will reveal to us now, he'll appear to us in our wilderness place when we allow him to appear to us in a manner that's beyond what we've experienced before. It challenges our rational mind, right? Doesn't it? We, if we're going to really encounter God in a fresh way, his supernatural fire, then we've got to be able to meet God off the grid of our reasoning and our, and our logic and our own intelligence. And I believe oftentimes God does that because he's challenges, challenging us and he's testing our heart. He's testing us. Do we have to figure everything out? Does God have to come the way we want him to come? Or do we have a heart that says, you're God and I'm not, and I'm faithful, but I'm believing you're about to reveal yourself to me in a really special way. We need to be looking for God beyond our natural understanding because he, set, he has set a burning bush right in your path. Hmm. Now, Moses, the Bible said, hid his face and trembled after he saw uh, you know, the burning bush and heard the voice of God. And uh, really... I, I don't know. Every time you see someone in the scripture that has a real encounter with the face of God, uh, the resurrected, glorified Christ, they tremble, they fall on the ground like dead, uh, and, and the Lord has to pick them up and say, it's okay. And so I'm a little leery. We've got all this craziness going on today, and, and everybody and his brother is having encounters with Jesus and, and talking to Jesus, and, and they testify like, you know, like they went down to the local diner and they met with Jesus, and yeah, Jesus. Jesus and me, and we're tight, you know. Uh, come on. Come on. You better be careful. God give the church discernment. We so need discernment. Am I saying that he does not appear to people? Oh, of course I'm not saying that. I believe he does more than we realize. But if he appears to someone in his holiness, in his righteousness, you're not going to go around slapping people. And, and, hey, let me tell you about Jesus. We're buds, man. We, we, we. Come on. I believe that that person would stand with a tremble in their voice. God, bring us back to, God, give us discernment. Anyway, God reveals himself to Moses from a bush on fire, then says, I send you to Pharaoh and tell him, let my people go. Wow. There are multitudes, there are multitudes all around us, oppressed, bound up. Bound up in sin, sickness, poverty, anxiety, depression, addictions. They're just bound up, amen? And they need, they need deliverance. And God is saying, I'm sending my servant with the fire of God and my authority to set them free. Now we know, you know what the Bible says in Obadiah? It says, in the last days, God will raise up out of Zion deliverers. That would be you and I. Now I get it. There are people out there in the world that are so bound up, they, they're, they're desperate, they're moaning, they're crying out and don't even realize it. Where is God? What is the answer to life? I know that, but I, I'm more burdened for God's people. I, I think at times... I'm more of a revivalist than I am an evangelist. As much as I want to see people get saved, I see right in the midst of the church, right among us, how many are groaning, how many are, are, are just groaning and travailing and crying out and yearning. I'm hurting, I'm broken, I need God. We're never going to see a true revival we're not going to see an awakening. We're not going to see, you know, the great harvest that we're all believing for, and it will come. But first, God's people need to get delivered. God's people need, come on, to get set free. Now, every one of you here this morning are called to be a deliverer in your sphere of influence. 
You're called to be a deliverer. With all the people you're in contact with, you're like Moses being sent, but you can't go until you've seen a burning bush. <laughs> we cannot truly go in that authority and be effective until, like Moses, we've had a burning bush experience and he sends us. God sent Moses. We are an apostolic people. We've been sent. Every one of you are apostolic. There's an apostolic anointing on you, and you have been sent. You have been sent to those around you to set them free. And let me say this. It's so important. Don't say, well, I'm not called to full-time ministry. Yes, you are. You truly are. Every one of us are called to a full-time ministry. A few people have been separated, and they've been called to train people for their full-time ministry. That's their full-time ministry. But you have been called to reach your family, your loved ones, your neighborhood, everybody you come in contact with, and you can't effectively do it without having an encounter with God where he, his fire fills your life and heart, and he sends you, and you know it. It's so important. And you can only be sent if you've been enrolled in the school of Moses. <laughs> oh, boy. Forty years. Now, that's a prophetic number, right? Whatever your years are, and I happen to believe you may have more than one set of wilderness years, but it's how many, how many years God has determined for your personal life, for your individual course, that God tests us. He takes us through all the necessaries. We go through the school of the Spirit. And what's crazy is if you're trying to live in the world and you're trying to understand it all through a carnal perspective, you will become so confused and frustrated because the world does not understand what you're doing and what you're going through. The world does not value your diploma from the school of the spirit is what I'm, what I'm trying to say. They'll mock you. They'll laugh at you. What a waste of time. What are you doing wasting your time? Because they don't understand the ways of the spirit. They don't understand what it means to have the hand of God upon you and preparing you. Come on. A degree in the school of the spirit is a waste. It's nonsense to the world. But it's absolutely imperative if we're going to receive the fire of God and we're going to be those that answer the groan and the cry of mankind all around us. Mm -mm -mm. So God sends a life-changing experience and encounter with Moses at a place called Mount Horeb. That's why I said Mount Horrible. Mount Horeb means desolate, barren, parched, wasted. Wow. This was the Prince of Peace. Not, no, he wasn't the Prince of Peace. That's Jesus. This was the Prince of Egypt, right? Did you know that Egyptians loathed, they hated shepherds? They said shepherds were the lowest, most despicable, pathetic occupation. Read it. The Bible says that literally. They just thought shepherds were pathetic. And so here God takes the man, the prince, who's being raised up and trained up to do great things in Egypt, he takes him, strips him of all that, and he ends up in the backside of the desert. Forty years to strip away all the eloquence, all the self, you know, confidence, all the, all the, the, the high-mindedness and learning, everything, you know, that Egypt pours into him. It's stripped, and he finds himself for 40 years in the school of the spirit, in the desert, my Lord. Wow. He could not go until he went through God's school of the spirit. And you know, there's so many, they have a good heart. Lord, I, I, I want to I share the gospel. I want to preach. I want to lay hands on the sick. And I'm not talking about being a preacher. I'm just talking about in your everyday life, doing what you're called to do. And so many want to go and so many want to do. And it's a good thing, and God says, until, until you have an encounter, until you have an encounter with my fire, your intentions may be good, but you're not going to have the authority, the unction to be successful. Boy, this is so, this is so important. You must have an encounter with the face of God and hear his voice. You've got to have a burning bush testimony. Now, where do I encounter my burning bush? <laughs> On the back side, not the front side. You encounter your burning bush. 
your fresh, life-changing encounter with the living God that transforms your life forevermore for now and all eternity, you're going to have that experience not on the front side but on the back side. We all want to be on the front side, right? The front side is the place of the flesh. It's the place of carnal man, you might say. It's where all the religious action is. We all love the front side, right? We like the lights and the glimmer, and we like uh, the, the camera and the action. We like to be up front where everybody can see us. We like to be on the stage. Watch me sing, watch me dance, watch me perform, watch me minister. Remember Christian Broadway? Hmm. Flesh, pride, and ambition pushes us to the front. Wow. Please look at me. Please receive me. You might say, well, you're missing it. That's not me. I don't want to be in the front anyway. I get it. But guess what? There's something in the heart of every man in their flesh that wants the approval of man. We want the applause of man, the approval of man, the recognition of man. So we'll get into that system and we'll get into the front. You know, many, many, many have pushed themselves without a lack of talent, gifts, anointing. They've had the, the, the charisma, and they've pushed themselves to the front only to find the applause is empty, only to find there's no authority in the words, there's no fire on their life, and you can only fool people so long. Mm -mm -mm -mm. The backside. Who wants to live there? You know where the backside is? Where you're going to meet God? Where you're going to meet your burning bush and be radically transformed? Every one of you here, I promise you, I don't have to eavesdrop in your prayer life. I hear a cry from the depths of your heart. Lord, I need a fresh encounter with you. That's what this is all about. Everything we're saying and doing, we need a fresh encounter with you, Lord. But God says, great, come with me to the backside. Come with me and follow your, your friend Moses. Let's go to the backside. Let's go to the place that's lonely. Let's go to the place where no one sees you. No one even knows what you do. Let's go to the place where you are fulfilled just to be a servant, just to be a blessing, just to be a support. Lord, I'm happy. I am absolutely fulfilled just knowing that I am pleasing you and I'm being a blessing. That's where it starts. That's where the burning bush is, my Lord. The seed of humility. Let me ask you this. How many of you want to be a hundredfolder for God? That means you're 100% God. 100% fruit. 100% of your life is God. That's part of the true remnant. But here's the thing. This is crazy. You must, you must be willing to go to the backside to move forward. Wow. In other words, to go to the front, to grow in God, to go to the fullness of everything God's called you to be, you've got to be willing to go backwards. We've got to go backwards in order to go forward. Remember we live in a topsy-turvy, upside-down kingdom? The way up is down. The way you receive is to give. And the way you go forward is to be willing to go backward. God is raising up his faithful servants, and he's taking them to the backside where it's dry, where it's barren, where it's confusing, where people don't know you or seem to care about you. Come on. The dry place, the place where there's stickers and thorns and, and, there's, uh, and there's nothing but rocks and stumps and all these snakes and cre cre creepy crawlers and critters and stuff. Ugh. That's a, that's a real me metaphor. I mean, is that where we're not living at times? You ever felt like you were there? Hmm. Interesting. Here's the definition. Here is the definition, dictionary definition of the back 40. Are you ready? Wild, rough terrain adjacent to desirable, productive, developed land. Whoa, whoa wait a minute. God is after the back 40. God sees the back 40 in your life and my life, and he's after it. What is that? It's the areas we have managed 
to so, <laughs> to so hide, keep hidden, keep away from God and other people. It's that area in our life that we know is still barren, it's still dry, it's still got lots of stickers and thorns, <clears throat> a few critters, <clears throat> a few creepy things. And we look at it and we say, I'm just going to hide that away. <laughs> I don't want anyone to see that. That's never going to change. And that's just, you know, that's that part of me. Whew, I'll keep that away. And God, hey, hey, look at me here. I got some good things I'm offering, right? And God says, you do, but I'm after the back 40. God is after the back 40. The areas in our life that we feel are weak, useless, broken, never be redeemed. He said, they're the very areas I'm after because that's the place. I'll reveal myself to you. The back 40. It's interesting, all the way back to ancient times, whenever there was a transaction, a deal, a, a land deal, oftentimes, whether it was the buyer or the seller, they would throw in the back 40 just to sweeten the pie. They'd go, well, okay, well, listen, well, if you don't want this land for that price, I'll throw in the back 40. It was like the, the, the waste area right? It was the area that nobody really cared about and they wanted to get rid of anyway. And so it's not a good thing to say that, you know, well, we'll take the back 40. But what did we just say the definition was? It was adjacent to the productive land. But here's what happens when you're willing to just look at it and say, wait a minute, that can be redeemed. Wait a minute, maybe I need to roll my sleeves up a little bit and get to work. And, and, and it ends up being so often that it's the back 40. That's the most prime land. It's the back 40 where you can you get in there and you can clear it out and it becomes the most productive soil for plants and crops. It's the place where you hit oil. It's the place where you mine and find gold. It's the place where you build developments and you go, oh my God, the back 40 was the most valuable. The back side was more valuable than the front side. Hallelujah. So here's Moses in the back side of the desert. He's not at the big convention. He's not, you know, up front in front of the multitudes. He's not, you know, rubbing shoulders with all the who's who in, in Christendom. Uh, he's not hobnobbing with all the politically correct ministers handing out their business cards. Come on. He didn't get chauffeured to the meeting in a, in a, in a fancy car wearing a designer suit. He meets God in the backside of a desert. Think about it. Think about it. The self-righteous, the self-righteous kicked him out of the front side to the back side and said, after all, you are a murderer. <sighs> in the place you have failed, in the place you have messed up, in the place where you hear condemning voices like yours constantly putting you down, the place where the devil likes to harass you, the place of your mistakes, the place in your life that you might think is the driest, most lonely place that you just want to forget about and hide, that's the place, that's the back 40, that's the place that God in all his mercy and goodness will reveal himself to you, not because you are something fancy, you went through some school and you've got these great gifts and talents. Amen. Now, it's in the back side where the back slidden. How many are backslidden? Then they started out with fire. They started out just zealous for God. They started out running after God. They had good intentions, boy. They had gifts and they had talents. They had plenty of passion and zeal. The only problem is they were running without an encounter. They were running without come on a commission from a burning bush and find themselves backslidden, it's okay. Because that's where God can then grab them and say, okay, I know your heart, but you did things a little different. You got ahead of yourself. What am I trying to say? It doesn't matter where you messed up, how life dealt you a bad blow, where people may look at you and criticize you and put you down, where you may think you're disqualified because of mistakes. You say, I'm in the backside. I'm in the backside of this thing called serving God. How am I ever going to be used of the Lord? You're at the very place. You're the best place. Amen. It's okay. You're getting ready to have a divine encounter. God makes his true sons and daughters in the backside of the desert. 
It's the place where you learn how to trust God for your provisions. You trust God. You know God. It's the place in the backside, like Moses, where you have no one to help you. There's times when man's not there. No one's there to give you encouragement. There's times when you find yourself so dry and barren. It's the place where you learn how to receive from God yourself and hear his voice. It's the place where you become thankful. You're so thankful in the little things. Come on. You can't afford to go to the big convention. You can't get off work. You can't get to the evangelist and the great healer. But you've found something better. You have found a burning bush in the secret place, in your prayer closet. And you've come to the place, come on, where you can find God and hear God and you can receive God and you don't even need, come on, you don't need Christian Broadway. You're able to hear from God right where you're at. God has developed in you this deep, deep relationship with him. And you know some good news? Then he'll put you in a church, in a church family, where everyone's doing the same thing and going after the same thing, and you're going to get to do it together. Now, to encounter the burning bush, God has sovereignly planned for you. You must be willing to turn aside. <laughs> How will I know it's God? You'll know. Because there's not too many bushes that burn and don't consume, and there's not many bushes that speak and call out your name. And uh, you just put, you put your own scenario into that. You hear what I'm saying? You gotta be willing to turn aside. God has set a divine appointment for every one of you. There's a burning bush encounter waiting for you. But you have to turn aside. It's not gonna come after you. God's gonna order your steps, lead you right to it, but you have got to notice it, and then you have got to turn aside. What does that mean? If we're gonna have a fresh encounter with God, you've got to be willing to turn aside. You've got to do something different. We've got to be able to turn aside from people. Hmm. You've got to be willing to turn aside from folks that really don't want to turn aside with you because they don't want God like you want God. You've got to be able to say to some people, sorry, I'm not going to do that, think like that, talk like that, can't do that, can't go there. I'm turning aside to my encounter with God. We gotta turn aside, church, from everyday routine. We've gotta turn aside from cancel this, suspend this regularly scheduled program. I have to turn aside for God. And you're gonna to have to come to a place, and this is the challenge for all of us, you've got to come to a place if you're gonna recognize your burning bush, your fresh encounter with God, to recognize that you've got to turn aside from your routine, from doing things the way you always do them. And that's our greatest challenge. Lord, I go to church once a week. I go to church twice a week. Lord, I do this, this, that, and the other. This is my religious routine. And as long as you're going to continue in your religious routine, you will never, never turn aside to see more of God. get angry with me. It's true. You don't think God challenges me with that? Oh, you want to turn aside and have a burning bush experience to transform your life in the fire of God? You think you're going to get that because you continue to do what you used to do? No. You got to be willing to break some routines. You got to be willing to break some schedules. We got to break out of our comfort zones. Mm-mm-mm-mm. The burning bush is there. The encounter is waiting for us. But we have got to put ourselves in the position to see it and receive it. And it only happens when we're willing to turn aside from things we've done in the world, things we do every day. We know it's not pleasing to God. Whatever it is to you, whatever, it, it's different for you than it is for me. And in many ways, it's also common. You've got to have discernment if you turn aside. That bush isn't going to sit there and burn forever waiting. There's a, there's a time slot. I see it. I'm going to go right through this and finish. 
Moses himself called the manifestation of God a great sight. <laughs> I love it. He didn't understand what it was quite yet, but he perceived, wait a minute, something great. There's something great over here waiting for me. Uh, I don't know exactly what it is, but I know I have to turn aside. How many great sights have you missed? How many great sights has this church missed? And we walked right by doing our thing. Oh, we're just still doing church, and we're still doing what we do. We love God, but uh, we missed a great sight because we were not cognizant. We were not aware. We were not discerning, and we walked right by and did not turn aside. And I love how Moses responded. He sees the burning bush. I will now turn aside to see this great sight and why this bush does not burn. Can you see Charlton Heston there? That's exactly what he says in the movie. I will now turn aside and see this great sight, why this bush would burn, would be consumed and not burn. Hallelujah. Why? Why? Why is this happening? You and I need a why. You and I need a why. A why cry. There has to come in you and I this thing in the depths of our being that says, I have to know God. I need God. I want more of God. Why, God? Why would you call me? Why would you draw me? You see, too many, too often, we want a, a burning bush experience. We want God to get a blessing. We want God to get a miracle. We want God so we can have a really cool testimony. We want God because we can be part of the group. And God says, sorry, that's not why I'm giving out burning bushes today. If you want a burning bush, you've got to have a cry. You've got to have a why deep in your spirit that says, why, God? Why would you allow me to see this? Why would you speak my voice, God? Lord, I want to know you. I'm going to enter into your heart. I, I want to know you. The children of Israel knew the acts of Moses, of God, rather. Moses knew his ways. It's not about, I get a new experience. I get blessed. I got a testimony. Wait till the people hear this testimony. No, it's a deeper why. Why would you call me? Why would you let me partake of this? Why would you call my name out of a burning bush? Why? Because I love you and I've chosen you. Even out of the back 40, you don't deserve it. You haven't earned it. You haven't worked for it. But I am sending you. I am hearing the cry and the groan of people all around you. And I'm looking for someone that will say, here I am, Lord. Send me. And I'm going to anoint you with fire. Because I know you'll be faithful. And I know you're going to carry my heart. I know it's not just a ministry. It's just not a thrill. You've entered into my very heart. You've been to the backside. You've been through everything it takes. And you've got a why rising up out of your heart and your voice. And I can reveal myself to you. And I'm going to give you my fire and my authority. <clears throat> Help us, Jesus. And so, as it was in the days of Isaiah, Isaiah's woeing everything he sees. God says, excuse me, son, you're right. It is a mess. They're a mess, but you see, I see a little different. I am so burdened. I hear their groan. I hear my people's cry and their travail. Tell you what, look up at me. Great. Bang. Puts fire on his mouth. Says, no, go back and do it again. I'm answering the groan of my people with fire. Moses, I'm going to answer the groan of my people with fire. And 2,000 years ago, when God the Father looked down at his creation, groaning, travailing, groaning and travailing, he said, enough is enough. It's the set time. And he sent his son to die on the cross. And then he gathered 120, and he sent the fire. And the Bible says they all cried out, what must we do to be saved? There was a moaning and a groaning and a cry from the depths of their bondage and captivity to sin. And God said, I'm sending 120 to answer the groan and the cry of my creation. And ever since that time to the time today, when there's been a cry and a groan, God has answered with fire. Can you hear Salem's cry? 
Can you not hear Salem's moan and travail and cry? Can't you hear the cry of the drug addict? The single mom? The sick, the afflicted? Those bound in religion, those under demonic oppression, can't you hear their groan? God's waiting for a people that will turn aside and receive an encounter. Everyone say encounter. Encounter. The fire of God. Do you know anyone? Do you know anyone that's groaning right now? Travailing. Desperate. I believe God wants to send you and he wants to send me. So don't despise your season that you've been in Horeb and you've been in the barren place. Guess what? It's time to come out. In this, I feel it and sense it. What God's doing, he's preparing that burning bush for this people and for those that are willing to turn aside. Get ready for an encounter that will change your life forever. I want to prophesy to you, turn aside. Turn aside. Whatever that means to you, turn aside. The Lord will show you. And guess what? Your burning bush will be different than mine. It could be this one glorious thing. It could be a, a series of things. It could, it could happen over time. That, that's up to God. Amen? But I believe with all of my heart we're in that season. It's time to turn aside and have a fresh encounter with God. That's what this is all about. Stand with me, would you? As a matter of fact, I think this is what the Lord has put on my heart that we should do every time because we've been praying to open these altars. There's something significant here. If you can simply respond by saying this, I want to turn aside. I believe that God has a burning bush waiting for me that will revelation, revolutionize, change my life. I want a personal encounter with God as a way and a means to demonstrate that. Will we come here and pray? Can we come together and pray? And just pray in the spirit of unity and agreement. God, we need a fresh encounter. A fresh encounter. You know, I'm pouring my heart out to you this morning about something. You got to hear this. One of my greatest challenges, one of the greatest mysteries for me as someone that has served the Lord for 46 years, here's my greatest question to God. Lord, why? Why is it so hard for us? Why is it so hard for so many of God's people to really receive your love and know that you love them? And know that your promises are true. To know that, God, you have good things for them. That you, you started a good work that you'll complete. Why do we struggle? Why? Why do so many people that love God, they go to church? I've been saved. I prayed the sinner's prayer three times. Been baptized. I, I'm trying. But, but it's like a chore. Come on. The Christian life ends up being more of a chore and a drudgery, and just, you know, I feel compelled, and I know it's true, and somehow I'll press through and do it, but something is missing. Something's missing. I believe it's because most of us have yet to turn aside and see that great sight that God's prepared for us. What am I saying? We need an encounter, an encounter with God, a life-changing encounter with God, and get so humble and broken and real and be real about living in the backside of the desert. It's the good place. God put you there because he sees the good in you. And I can tell you something. Can I testify? The only reason I'm still standing, the only reason I'm still standing today Despite all the hassles, rejections and stuff, personal tragedies, heartaches, why? how can I still stand here? 
One reason. The grace of God. And I had an encounter with God 46 years ago. You can't take it from me. No one can take it from me. I had an encounter with God, and that's the one thing I know. I don't know a whole lot, but I know this. I had a life-changing encounter with the living God. I had an encounter with a burning bush, and by the grace of God, I've had several since then. You see, listen, there's an old saying. You can argue about a man's opinion. You cannot argue about his experience. Man can argue with you all they want about your God and what you believe. They'll never argue about your experience. No one's going to move me. No one's going to tell me there's not a God. No one can ever going to tell me that God Almighty didn't reach down and touch me and change me forever. I'm here only by the grace of God. But I also recognize I need a fresh encounter. Don't get upset with me. Our young people, our young people, we're going to change some stuff here. It's got to change. If you haven't noticed, a lot of stuff's going to change. And if it doesn't do, if we don't do what God's doing, then we may miss a great sight he has set before us. That's a scary place, but it's a great place. <laughs> How do we expect our youth to be on fire for God in the midst of all this world and what's happening if they don't get an encounter with him. <coughs> I can't. We have got to be intentional to get, bring our young people and, and rally them and say, come on, walk with us. God has an encounter with you. you, you we can't do it by putting them in a class for an hour. You can't do it by even trying to train them and teach them. Yes, that's important, but we've got to bring them to a place where they can turn aside with us and have a life-changing encounter with God Almighty. If they can't, come on, if I can't make it without the reality of a God burning in my heart, how can they? How can they do it? We need an encounter with God. You can't take it from me. I can't take it from you. And I am prophesy to you that it's a season right now. I'm, I don't know how to say it other than I pray your heart burns to receive what I'm saying. God has allowed us to go through a lot in these years. But I'm determined it's a season in God. I know what I know. I know that we've been through a backside for a season. But I know that God has set a burning bush. And he's saying for those that have an ear, a heart that desires more of me, get ready to turn aside. If you're willing to turn aside, you'll never be disappointed. I'm going to bring a fresh revelation of my fire and my presence and my call on your life. And he wants to do it with our young people. How can we make it? Can you make it without God? No. I can't make it in this world without not just knowing God. Uh, I can quote some scripture and I go to church. Well, good for you. I'm going to make it because the fire of God is burning in my heart. I've had an encounter. How can we expect less for our kids? When I was in Baltimore, we had a, a K through 12 school, Christian school. Both my kids, they went through the whole thing. And you know what? It's, we tried so hard. Teach, train, teach them, have curricular, do, do everything to just keep their eye on Jesus. Yes, good, we should do that. But I remember a couple times, we had a special speaker come in, or we had something happen in the main sanctuary where God's presence came in, and the pastor said, go tell the teachers, get all the kids in here. I don't care if they're in the middle of a test or they're at recess, get them in here. And I'll never forget, they would come in, and the power of God would hit them. And they'd fall dead on the ground, shake it, and they'd weep, and they'd cry. That was more valuable than years of teaching. And te Don't misunderstand me. You know how I feel about teaching. And <laughs> they needed an encounter. Remember my, my nephew, Michael Badalado? He came here and shared. 
By the way, he's out every weekend now. God has so raised him up. He's all over the place preaching and doing revival. Do you know his testimony? He was raised in church. <laughs> he was raised in church. He heard it all. But he went into the world. He became a heroin addict. He, became a, he, just, he was a mess. He went to boarding school. He went to reform school. He went to, he went to uh, rehab. He went to all these programs. And one day, he testified, if you remember, one day... He was at Teen Challenge. He was walking down the hall, and he heard the sound of music in the chapel. It, he, <laughs> he wasn't told to go, and he turned aside to see this great sight. And he walked in where there was a few people standing there, and the presence of God came over him like a fire. And God revealed himself to him. He's never been the same since he had a radical conversion that's more valuable than all the teaching and all the programs and all the activities he had an encounter with the living God and God set him on fire and it's just growing more day by day and he'll stand up and testify I needed the fire of God right in the backside in my wilderness and God was faithful I'll share one more. And honey, I trust it's okay. Her oldest son. What a wonderful young man. He'll be 40 years old next month. Brilliant. He's an attorney in L.A., partner in his firm. One of the most intelligent persons I ever met. you got to have a dictionary with you when you talk to him. Okay, would you wait a minute? And compassionate. I mean, just an amazing young man. And you know what he said to me when I was with him last time? He said, I was raised in church, but he said, I had to know for myself, is God real? So I became a philosophy major. Now, you got to know this guy's brain. So he became a philosophy major in college, studied all the philosophies, and said, I determined through all my logical deduction that God is real. God is real, right? God is real, and all these philosophies are vain philosophies, and I know in my mind that he is real, so I am a Christian. And then he said, but there's one thing I lack. I desperately need an encounter. And his name happens to be Josiah, which means the fire of God. And he's the firstborn, and God has got a burning bush for him. Someplace, somewhere, he's going to have that encounter, especially with a praying mama. He is going to have that encounter. But that point is simply this. We can't do it just up here. I fibbed. I'd have one more story. I just saw it on Charisma Magazine two nights ago. I'm looking at Charisma Magazine. And it says, testimony of church in Corpus Christi. And it said, the pastor, this is a good church. The pastor said, hey, okay, I heard from God, total change. Every program, every program is canceled. Every program, every activity, every ministry canceled. We're going to preach, praise, and pray. We're going to come together until we have an encounter with God. That's the very words. Go look it up. Two days ago, I don't know what's titled. They began to do that for months. And guess what? There was a divine appointment at that right time because they decided they were going to do it and go after God together. And the fire of God fell upon them. And the youth and the young adults and the high school and the college-age kids got so on fire for God. Right now, there's 10 clubs. They have started clubs. Clubs. Clubs in the local public schools and in the colleges. They've taken the fire out. And they're the answer to, come on, a groaning generation of young people. Yes. You know what I'm saying. Father, we're here this morning. And we acknowledge that, God, there's more. And we just simply want more. You have a burning bush. You have specifically sovereignly set for every one of us here something that will reveal yourself to us in a greater way 
set us ablaze and on fire, that, Lord, we will go into this world to those that are groaning and broken. Lord, we're the groaning. We're the groaning and travailing in so many ways. We need a fresh encounter with you. Now, Lord, together, we make that commitment. We make that commitment. Lord, we pray for sensitivity. We pray for your anointing and discernment that we will not miss the great sight that you have set for each of us and a fresh experience with your fire and your voice. Thank you, Lord.